Listeners of the Geopolitics and Empire podcast may have noticed we've been quiet over the summer months, but now we are back for another season with better equipment and a new resolve. Don't forget to support us by subscribing to all of our social media and not only the big tech monopolies, but the alternative channels such as Vimeo, Real.Video, SoundCloud, Minds, Steemit, and Gab. You can also support us via Patreon, PayPal, and Bitcoin. We return to the broadcast with cultural historian Dr. Morris Berman. His works include a trilogy on human consciousness, a trilogy on the American empire, numerous recent works which include poetry, fiction such as The Man Without Qualities, and Neurotic Beauty, which is a fascinating look into Japan. We'll be discussing his latest book titled Are We There Yet?, which consists of a collection of lectures, unpublished essays, and reflections on the continued decline of American empire. Our previous discussions with Dr. Berman covered his trilogy on American empire, and listeners can go back and listen to those talks. On this episode, we'll be catching up on what's going on with the empire since then, centered around his latest book, Are We There Yet? Dr. Berman, what more can be said of life after the U.S. empire uh, about President Trump? How would you assess his presidency since his election 2016? Uh, It seems to me that a lot of people are talking about Trump today, but I think they, they miss the point. You know, when, when you talk, there's, he's just a symptom of a bigger s- systemic uh, crisis. So wh- 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 how can you update us? What's been going on since, since your trilogy uh, came out? Well, thank you for having me here, and thank you for the question. Um, yeah, I guess the question is, is there life after empire? <laughs> Maybe that's what it is. Um and uh yeah trump definitely is a symptom but you know it's a question of how you want to frame it um hegel wrote about the so-called world historical individuals and what he meant by that was that sometimes in history frequently in fact there are major trends going on and somebody will arise who represents or epitomizes those trends most closely And that person then is the agent of that change. Um, For Hegel, those people were interchangeable. If it wasn't Napoleon, it would have been Monsieur Fanac or somebody like this, you know. Uh, But the important thing is that the individual do the work of history with a capital H. I mean, that was the idea that uh, this world historical individual was was carrying the, the major trend of the moment. And in the case of the United States, the major trend of the moment is decline. It's to disintegrate, and that's what's happening. I would say that the story of the 21st century is the disintegration of capitalism, and at the same time, the replacement of American hegemony by Chinese hegemony. Those are the dramas that we're living in. And uh, uh, Trump is fits the mold that Hegel was talking about. Trump is a world historical individual, and his job is to dismantle the United States. It's to accelerate that collapse. And frankly, uh, after one year and nine months, I think we can all agree he's doing a fabulous job of it. Um, Everything he does is a blunder. Everything he does is destructive. And that's what history is calling for. That's exactly it. He's just doing his job. Um, That that. The world historical individual uh, appears in a form we didn't expect, is in fact uh, quite common. Napoleon was a comic figure. You know, he was short and he wore this funny hat, and nobody would have thought prior to his emergence that this particular individual would be the, the person to carry the French Restoration and all of that that happened in the in the wake of the Revolution. Nobody would have picked Napoleon. Um, I remember some time ago reading um, Henry Kissinger's memoirs, and he states at one point that he looked over at Richard Nixon. They were sitting in the Oval Office, and he looked over at Richard Nixon, whose pants were too short, who was wearing white socks, and who spoke kind of bumbling English, you know. Uh, And he looked at the man, I mean, nobody was saying anything, but he looked at him and he thought, you know, this guy's a dork. (laughs) I mean, that's the reality. 
Richard Nixon is a dork. And isn't it amazing the people that history selects to carry the banner of this trend that they're supposed to carry? Um, you know, it doesn't discriminate. It just picks somebody. Uh, and the same thing can be said of Trump, I think. He's vulgar. He's a boor. He has no political experience whatsoever. And yet, here he is, um, head of what is still, uh, for a while yet, the most powerful country on earth. And uh, he is leading the way down. Uh, somehow, history just chose this guy with a freakish haircut and um, no, not an ounce of grace at all to do the work of dismantling the American empire. Um, you know, you, you have to be impressed by things like that. And I guess Kissinger was. And could we say, uh, you know, for this world historical individual, I mean, if it wasn't Trump, it would have been some other person, right? Why, sure. Actually, if Hillary had won, uh, that would have been her role. The only thing is that uh, she would have, it would have been the, the, the disintegration process, which is what we're living through, would have been much slower. Uh, if she had, uh, you know, be, become president, it would have been a much slower process. Um, I guess history decided that as far as the American decline wa went, we just needed to accelerate it a bit. And so it chose Trump. But um, it really doesn't matter anymore. Uh, I mean, in the case of Obama, he was just treading water. Uh, you know, he wasn't accelerating or decelerating. He had no idea what his presidency was about anyway. He didn't really stand for anything. And so it was just sort of hovering in midair for eight years. Uh, but now we're getting down to serious business. And uh, as I said, it could, it could have been Hillary or uh, it could have been Kim Kardashian. You know, that would have been neat. Well, it, it might. Uh, that was kind of my next question where I was leading into. It might be Kim Kardashian. I don't know if you recall this American comedy from, I think it was 2006, called Idiocracy, where they go into the future and find that America has become comically dumbed down. No? Right. It was uh -huh. uh, Luke Wilson and right. Mira Sorvina. Yeah, right. Hilarious film. And, yeah. um Right, right. And quite, quite accurate. Uh, you know, I mean, that's certainly the direction we're going in. Uh, if you asked 30 years ago, stop somebody in the street, and you said, uh, uh, who is Dwight Eisenhower? They would say, well, he was president in the 50s. If you do that today, they'll just look at you blankly. Well, uh, I, I thought of that. Well, you mentioned Kardashian, and we've heard that for the 2020 uh, elections, you know, people such as Oprah, uh, The Rock, uh, the film star, uh, the Starbucks founder, Howard Schultz, People like this are rumored to be running for the next ele election. And I just kind of find that the comical that we've got now, just a gamut of celebrities putting themselves well, out Well, and, and, you know, I have to add that I don't think myself that there's a great difference in intellectual depth between Kim and Trump. You know, I mean, they're they're pretty much in the same league intellectually. Uh, they don't read. They have the attention span of a gnat. Uh, they don't know anything, really. And and um, so it's not that far-fetched. And, you know, if I mention, well, Kim Kardashian for president, you can all laugh. But the truth is that we were laughing in 2015 at the possibility of Trump, and here he is. And as far as somebody like Oprah goes, I mean, just a new age flake, nothing to her. Um, no qualifications whatsoever. Uh, I could see her easily being elected. And the thing that was interesting is that people like Steven Spielberg and Meryl Streep came out on her behalf, said, oh, she would make a great president. Now, Streep and Spielberg cannot be accused of being stupid. And yet, that's just about the dumbest thing you can say. My response is, where are your brains? Where are your brains? She's a new age flake. She believes that... Uh, if your life sucks, it's your fault. Perfect American ideology, by the way, you know. Uh, and uh, if you want to be successful, uh, like Norman Vincent Peale said, you just have to have a positive outlook. Uh, I mean, it doesn't get any dumber than that. And here you have, you know, people that are obviously intelligent, major film stars, obviously very bright, 
say, oh, yes, you'd make a great president. And uh, in your book, Are We There Yet?, which people can purchase on uh, Amazon, you wrote an essay on the farce of Hillary Clinton. What more can we can be said about her? I would have thought she would have faded into irrelevance, but she keeps coming back like a like a zombie. Um, she might run again in 2020. What are your thoughts? I doubt she would run again in 2020. I doubt that the uh, the DNC would want to have anything to do with her. Once you're stigmatized as a loser, it's pretty hard to make a comeback. I think, but. You're right. What in the world is she doing as a as a presence on the American scene? And uh, part of it is that uh, she just can't let go. I mean, she felt entitled to the presidency. It was a pretty bitter pill to swallow that uh, she actually won the election, the popular vote by three million votes, and still did not wind up in the White House. Pretty bitter pill to swallow. But she can't let go, and part of that not letting go, I mean, the book, What's Happened, What Happened, is that it was everybody except her. Uh, the re, you know, it was Comey, and it was uh, Putin, but everybody except Hillary. That's the, where the fault lay. And in general, that's the position that progressives uh, take. Uh, this was a, a fluke. And it wasn't their fault. They didn't. They didn't bring this on. Oh no! Uh, and so there's an inability, uh, you know, to look within and figure out the reality of American politics. They're not interested in that, and she's not interested in that. And in general, uh, Hillary is more of a presentation than an actual person. I mean, she doesn't really stand for anything. And um, I think, as far as uh, you know, material for candidacy. Uh, she's pretty much roadkill at this point. Um, she lost for a number of reasons, but one of the major ones was that in the debates, Trump characterized her correctly. He was able to identify her correctly uh, as a continuation of the status quo. And he said that. He said, um, if you think Obama is your type of president and you want that administration to continue, then she's your man. That's who you ought to vote for. And furthermore, uh, she's all words. Nothing she says has any reality to it. It's just words. And both of those things were true. And I think people watching those debates could see it. Um, on top of that, I mean, there were rumors that she had had a lot of Botox treatments in her face prior to the uh, uh, election campaign. And, you know, Botox freezes you up so that um, the muscles can't extend very much. And when she attempted to smile or laugh, she looked kind of ghoulish. Uh, I mean, there was a kind of almost insane kind of look to her face. Um, and in addition, it matched the fact that everything she said was scripted. Whereas in the case of uh, Trump, he proudly said that he didn't prepare for the debate, that he was basically speaking authentically, which I think was correct, that is for him, uh, off the top of his head, and um, it worked. I mean, people saw somebody who was scripted and frozen, and then they saw somebody who was uh, energized and real. And uh, what's, what's left of Hillary the latest public appearance that she made was about a month ago. Uh, it was at a book fair. I can't remember where. But um, just seeing her uh, on uh, the screen after that, she was wearing a dress that was actually a large blanket and uh, looked disheveled and a bit half crazed. I mean, she looked like somebody who was recently released from a mental institution. Why she would dress up like that, uh, you know, for public appearance is not clear to me, but uh, I, I think uh, she doesn't realize that her days are numbered, but I think most people do. I think you described her outfit <laughs> pretty well. Just your quick thoughts uh, on Russia Gate. Um, you know, I, I, I wouldn't doubt the possibility of Trump having some mafia-like uh, financial dealings or, or history 
going back to the Soviet Union uh, or Russia. But I, I personally don't buy the the connection between Putin and, and Trump. So some people are saying that R Russia was heavily involved in the U.S. election with Trump. Uh, and others are saying that it was a, some sort of false flag by the Democrats acting as sore losers. And in your book, Are We There Yet?, when you, uh, a section of it where you talk about the U.S. surveillance state, you mentioned Bill Binney, who was the head of the, uh, he, he had a high position in the NSA. Bill Binney, together with some other experts, such as Ray, Ray McGovern, who I've also interviewed, a CIA officer, and including Julian Assange of WikiLeaks, they have done some forensic uh, research, which indeed does point to the Democratic Party uh, coming out with a lot of this Russiagate stuff. What are your thoughts there? Is, 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 and is that just another uh, symptom of this divisive politics within the U.S.? Well, I, I think it's the continuation of the discussion we just had uh, about Hillary not being able to look at uh, the reason that she lost. And uh, the Democrats in general, or progressives in general, and certainly the uh, mainstream media, don't want to lose, the, in the loss of the election, they don't want to lose the election. So they want to cancel Trump's victory. And one way to do that is discredit the victory by saying he cheated. And so if you can do all this, um, it amounts to a red herring or, or a smokescreen, basically, um, that, uh, you know, it's all Russian machinations and that's why. And so that the presidency is discredited and uh, um, has no validity. I mean, this is what we fill our the pages of the New York Times and the Washington Post with uh, to keep uh, Americans all busy with uh, Robert Mueller and, and, and whatever it will be. Um, this is, this is, I think, a big part of it, that um, it really is a tempest in a teacup, but there's an attempt by certain political forces to blow it up so that you discredit the presidency. Um, I think it's very possible that uh, Russia interfered in our election, but my reaction to that is, so what? You know, clean your own house before you start pointing fingers. We have interfered in the democratic electoral process of one country after another, and including Russia. In 1996, we wanted Boris Yeltsin elected a prime minister, and you know what? We got it, and we interfered, and we meddled in that election. Uh, so who are we to now say uh, Russia has no right to meddle in ours? Um, if you read um, oh books like Overthrow by Steve Kinzer, who used to be a New York Times reporter, I think he's worked for The Guardian now, um, Overthrow or my book, Dark Ages America, or various books by William Blum and several other authors, it's very well documented how basically we interfered in free democratic elections of other countries how the CIA overthrew uh, the person who got elected, for example, Allende in Chile or Masadic in Iran, um, because we didn't want that regime. We wanted one that was more favorable to us, especially economically. So we stepped in and destroyed those countries, usually helped to initiate a torture regime in those countries, Guatemala, uh, Iran, and so on, uh, Chile certainly. Um, and brutalized those countries uh, for our economic and political benefit. But, but the mainstream media doesn't talk about that. Oh, no. Let's just talk about how Russia may have meddled in this election. You know. And since the American uh, population is, quite frankly, not too bright and also very poorly informed, these are not people who study history, uh, they look at all this hubbub with Robert Mueller and whatever it is about influence and they get all excited about that. But there's no awareness. There's no awareness at all of what we've done to others. And uh, frankly, if Americans, my view is that if Americans were sat down and informed of this, they would just shrug their shoulders. 
Yeah, and you mentioned Stephen Kinzer. We've had him on the podcast a couple of times, and he writes for the Boston Globe, uh, I believe. Um, oh, is that right? Okay. Yeah. I thought he'd gone over to The Guardian, but maybe he's with The Globe now, yeah. And, you know, a theme that runs throughout your, your books, which I think is an important factor uh, of the decline, besides just the simple historical process of where empires rise and fall, uh, in one of your essays from Are We There Yet, you discuss drugs, uh, screen tech technology and the inability of Americans to use well self examination as you as you mentioned recently and, and the inability of Americans to use solitude as a sort of spiritual balancing mechanism I guess and, and you describe this dumbing down of America and how this also ex extends into u s foreign policy um, there's widespread uh, depression and, and mental illness, the use of prescription drugs. So this must be a substantial factor in the decline of an empire. So, you know, w what can you tell us about that? D does this, and I think this also goes hand in hand with this obsession with entertainment as well, which is sort of a, kind of like a drug. Um, and towards the end of the Roman Empire, I guess they were also becoming obsessed with the bread and circuses and entertainment. So uh, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, there are certain similarities. I mean, uh, there are some historians that believe that um, the viaduct was uh, lined with lead, Roman utensils were made of lead. Uh, the Romans, on a daily basis, were poisoning themselves, and so their brains were... And I don't know how valid the thesis is. I mean, there are uh, certainly other um, non-chemical causes for the decline of Rome, but that may have you know, been a factor... And we have our own version of that in terms of uh, cell phones, smartphone screens, uh, and then also, um, you know, the use of alcohol and opioids and, and so on. So uh, there are, uh, I think, certain similarities. Um, Rome died kind of spiritually, you know, after Julius Caesar and um, as it became an empire, uh the it lost meaning it really lost meaning and the individual citizen felt that and then how do you create uh meaning in your li life you know it becomes the question um in the united states uh the obvious collapse of the american dream uh has led millions of people uh to become addicted to screens uh to opioids to alcohol because they have nowhere to turn in terms of finding meaning. Um, there have been a number of uh, sociologists who have written about how in America, the religion is America itself. And uh, that's a curious thing to think about. But as early as 1955, Will Herbert wrote a book called Protestant Catholic Jew, in which he said, oh, we can talk about all these various sects, but the truth is that the religion of America is America. Um, you, uh, somebody might say, oh, I'm an Episcopalian, but he's not. He's an American. That's the religion. And if the religion starts to die, people get frantic. Um, and I've seen this, you know, I don't really have discussions with too many Americans anymore, but um, my impression is, from my, my own experience and others, is that if you mention anything critical about the United States, you're just sitting in a train with somebody or a cafe or something, and you mention anything critical, they go nuts. They go nuts. Uh, they start waving their arms and they're spraying saliva. They get red in the face. And their reply is just to shout slogans, you know, like USA, USA. Um, this shows how bankrupt uh, the citizenry is, certainly intellectually but also bankrupt spiritually, because if you're reacting like that, then that's an admission that the person you're arguing with is right. Um, that's why you're getting all worked up, because you suspect uh, the worst thing possible, that he may be correct. And um, that's, I, I think, uh, a big part of uh, what's going on now, uh, that I, I talked about spiritual death as early as the Twilight book, the first in my American Empire trilogy, which was published in 2000, and said that basically we we were dying from the inside, and I, I think that's correct. In the 18 years since I wrote that book or published that book, 
um, things have only gotten more obvious and worse in that direction. Statistics of suicide, drug use, homicide. I mean, these things are through the roof. You know, that reminds me of a story I recently had uh, when I was in the U.S. and speaking to some Americans. Um, and we were talking about how in Mexico, one of my homes, uh, childbirth out of pocket, you know, if you don't have health insurance, you know, the, the whole package paying the pediatrician, the doctor, the hospital costs about $1,500 for a really good level quality level of, of care, $1,500 to have a kid. In the U.S., I mean, I, I couldn't believe this. If you don't have insurance, twenty to $30,000 for a kid. Um, yeah, imagine that. Imagine that. I mean, it's un <laughs> unbelievable. And so I was talking to these Americans and, and just telling them, you know, I'm, I haven't been living in the U.S. anyways, but for like a decade now, but that I, you know, I was going to finally settle back home to my ethnic roots somewhere in, in Europe and maybe take a year off and have just, this, you know, some small income coming in and, and, you know, take care of the family, do other stuff. And they, they, they were just refusing to accept w what I was saying. And they kept saying, no, 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 you're, you're going to come back to America. We, we, we know you're going to come, you're going to be back in America. That's not going to work out for you. And it was kind of like they, they couldn't believe I don't know what it was. It's kind of like what, you, what you're saying, that, that they, they can't believe it's better somewhere else or, or, or what's going on there. Well, somebody once wrote that when myth is confronted with fact, myth always wins. It doesn't matter how good your empirical data are. People caught in a mythology, for example, the American dream, which is what you're describing, will not change their mind based on any factual material. In the industrialized or yeah, in the industrialized world, in terms of health care quality, uh, America is number 37. Most Americans believe it's number one. In fact, it's a, it's a, it's a debacle, it's a tragedy. Um, 20 to 30 thousand dollars to have a kid should tell you something. But these kinds of facts don't matter, and that's when the faces get red and they start to spit and wave their arms uh, because you know, they understand that uh, on some level that uh, you've got the facts. All they've got is the myth, and the myth is pretty thin by now. I, I wanted to move forward a, a bit. The, for me, the, the, this question is, you know, I'm very interested in, in this, and I've been reading authors, well, such as yourself, and Johan Galtung, who we've interviewed, and Alfred McCoy, and, and others such as economic forecaster Martin R. Armstrong, and all of them, including yourself, separately have been saying that by 2020, 2030, that that those are that's kind of the time frame for uh, the vi more visible decline, where the U.S. will remain still powerful, but will have clearly lost its unilateral uh, position and perhaps be a, a leader among peers such as China and Russia at, at best. Your your vision of American collapse is more of the slow Roman type. Um, and but in your essay again in in your book, are we there yet? You cited. Gary Steingart's, I think, the Super Sad Love Story was the mm -hmm. book, uh, which I'll have to go out and read. It looks sounds very interesting. He discusses a more rapid Soviet-style uh, collapse where America's tried everything to salvage the empire to no avail, and all its foreign interventions begin to fail. And anyways, you wrote that essay in 2010, and I think you said 15 to 20 more years should do it. So, you know, that would take based on when you wrote that, that's like 20, 25, 20, 30, matching with Alfred McCoy, Johan Galtung, and all these other people. Uh, could you talk more about this this trend of 2020, 2030, and uh, how you see this decline petering out? Well, first, uh, I have to say you're right that uh, a number of people who are interested in the question of um, civilizational decline have all come to the same conclusion independently and almost precisely uh, to the same years. Uh, quite remarkable. Uh, you know, I mean, I don't, I haven't read 
Dalton or McCoy. Uh, I mean, I'm aware of their existence. I've read their work, and I'm just not surprised that independently all of us would come to the same conclusion. Uh, I should also say that about a week ago, out of the blue, uh, another person who uh, does not have uh, that kind of uh, visible uh, you know, professional reputation, but who is uh, a businessman and a consultant who has been studying this, uh, sent me this 27-page document uh, that was so data-rich, it was, it was almost boring. I mean, you know, you just had to wade through the graphs and the charts. But it was the same thing. It, he came to the same conclusion. And I'm reading this, and what he says is that um, the next crash, 2008 style, will happen between 2019 and 2021. And then the wipeout crash, from which there is no recovery, will begin in 2026. And, you know, I mean, in his own mind anyway, uh, he had proven this because the empirical data was really heavy and I just wasn't shocked. Um, so I think a number of us are, are coming to the same conclusion. And there, it's not like we're pulling numbers out of a hat. It's that we've studied the, the trends that are building up in this direction. So uh, it seems uh, likely uh, that um, that this would go on, that this would occur, and um, within that time frame. I actually expected, after 2008, I actually expected that there would be another crash like that within five years. I was very surprised that by 2013 it hadn't happened. And talking with Nomi Prince, you know, she recently wrote this book called Collusion. She's an old friend of mine, and talking with her as somebody who really is an economic expert. Um, I said, how come there hasn't been another crash? And she said, you know, it's a long discussion, but there are a number of factors that have postponed it uh, unexpectedly. And um, so what, what she and other economists like her are saying is that um, there is a delay but it's not an indefinite delay. Uh, we cannot put off the fact that the system is going to just crumble, implode. It's going to crumble from within. And I think that's probably correct. And so uh, the, the dates are, are for all ultimate disaster starting around 2025 or 2026. Uh, I, th I think that's most likely. Now, one of the reasons I believe that there was going to be another crash by 2013 was that in the wake of uh, to the, the crash of 2008. It's once again, it's not like, as, as in the case of Hillary Clinton or the progressives, it's not like you sit down and say, gee, we must have been doing something wrong. What was it? Let's figure it out. That never happened with the progressives. It never happened with Hillary. And it never happened with the guys on Wall Street. Um, they... When they analyzed it, they came to the conclusion that it was everybody else's fault but their own. And what they continued to do was exactly what they had been doing before the crash. Obama appointed people like Geisner and Larry Summers, uh, whose ideology, the whole neoliberal globalized expansion thing, was exactly what had brought the system down. So why in the world would you appoint uh, people who are going to continue what didn't work? What could be possibly going through your mind that that would make sense? And um, in addition, uh, Wall Street and the banking establishment continue the whole process of uh, um, credit swap and derivatives and leverage buyouts and junk mortgages. All of that continued. So, you know, that old saying about in the definition of insanity is doing the same thing and expecting a different result. How is it we were going to get out of this mess by doing what we had done before? Well, we did for a while, and that's what I would say. It's the, the recovery that was um, boasted was a stock market recovery. It wasn't a recovery for most citizens. 40% uh, of the American public is one paycheck away from not being able to eat or get medical care. Um, it was, this recovery was a recovery in quotes. And so sooner or later, 
I think there's going to be a general collapse. But it's coming from multiple directions. The things that we've just talked about so far, uh, you know, like spiritual death and opioids. I mean, it's coming from multiple directions. And um, what was the phrase that, uh, the word that, oh yes, Freud used the word overdetermined. When you have several factors bearing down on a situation, moving it all in the same direction, that outcome is overdetermined. And that's what we have today, uh, uh, a number of threads converging onto a point, and that point is collapse. And, and just to finish that thought, uh, since we were talking about the finance, financial system and the economy, and, and Nomi Prince, who, who uh, I've interviewed as well on the podcast a couple of times, and actually met her, great author, people should go check out her new book, uh, Collusion. Um, I just finished reading a book by investor Jim Rogers called Street Smarts, where he shares his life story. And he's, he quoted, he said something very interesting. He said that for young men and w women looking to prosper in 1800, you wanted to head for London. Uh, in 1900, you would head for New York. And in the 2000s, that you should be heading for Asia, which is where I am currently. And Jim Rogers has... Uh, he, he walked the walk and he, he's living in Singapore now. And that, that just made me think uh, of my recent trip to the U.S. when I spoke to someone who says they pay $12,000 in property taxes per year. And this is, this is a young, young person. And I, I cannot, I simply can't fathom this. You know, in Mexico, I pay $50 property tax. Uh, in Europe, I, there's no property tax where I have a home. And you know, why would I want to live somewhere where I have to pay, uh, you know, such a huge amount, not just property taxes, health care, everything, the inflation. As you were mentioning, most Americans don't have savings. Um, just this week, they talked about uh, historic high, record high uh, in car payments. Um, and in your book, you you as well um, allude in, in you, um, that one of the best things an American could do is uh, emigrate. Anyone with half a brain should emigrate. What are, what are your thoughts uh, there? Well, young people ask me that question all the time. You know, I get emails or if I give a lecture, young people come up to me and they say, what should I do? What should I do? And I say, look, you're not going to take my advice, but I'll give it to you straight. What do you think is waiting for you 40 years down the line? We are going to be at war with some Fakakta country on the other side of the planet that poses no military threat to us whatsoever and spend $10 trillion doing it. We're going to loot the treasury for no good reason at all. There will be no social safety net. There will be no social security, no Medicare, no Medicaid. None of that will be available to you. And if you're lucky enough to get a job, which will probably be flipping burgers at McDonald's, uh, you're not going to be able to retire because you're not going to be paid enough to be able to afford, you know, whatever health insurance, private health insurance you might be able to get or um, food, <laughs> a car, you know, a house, whatever you think. You will not be able to afford it. You will not be able to retire and you'll die like a dog. Now it's up to you. You want that? Stick around. Um, I think you will stick around, but I'm going to tell you this. Forty years from now, you're going to say, you know, some guy came to our college when I was an undergraduate, and we thought he was a nutcase, and he told us, all of us, uh, that we should emigrate, we should get out, uh, get a student visa, study something in France, uh, marry somebody in that culture, and get your green card, and that's it. Um, and we all laughed. We thought he was out of his mind. Now I'd give my left arm to have taken his advice. I said, that's what you're going to do. You're not going to listen to me, and you are going to bitterly regret it 40 years down the line. And they're kind of shell-shocked that somebody is saying this, you know. And when they say, how about you? I say, well, 12 years ago, I moved to Mexico. It was the happiest, smartest decision of my entire life. And uh, I'm not constantly... Uh, worried uh, that uh, I am uh, going to go down the drain 
and my relations with the people around me are warm and friendly as opposed to being hostile and competitive. I said, you know, the United States does a great snow job. We're number one, but they're number one in misery. Get out now. And you mentioned some type of future conflict. Do uh, you think the U.S. will, its collapse will lead to a major war or just a series of smaller conflicts? Well, you know, it's said that uh, Rome died the death of a thousand cuts, that, um, you know, every day something was worse <laughs> and slowly built up. And that's true. And that's the American situation as well. However, it's also true in the case of Rome that there were what I call nodes. In other words, there were punctuation points, like the sacking of Rome in 410 AD by the Visigoths. Um, in other words, there were crucial moments that pushed it dramatically in a kind of quantum leap further down that trajectory. So we've had, excuse me, we had 9-11, that was a node. We've had the economic crash, 2008, that was a node. There are going to be more nodes, you know. Daily life will get worse uh, in a gradual way, the death of a thousand cuts. But there will also be these punctuated uh, events that will knock the country into uh, a tailspin, as 9-11 did, as 2008 did. Uh, we're not finished with those kinds of events, and they'll push us over the cliff. There's no doubt in my mind about that. And what about some kind of second civil war? It seems like we're starting to see echoes of 1860s and, and 1960s, where there's this huge divide between Americans from the left and the right, uh, and it's, it's we're starting to see some of violence. Uh, what are your thoughts there? Uh, well, I don't know about, uh, you know, whether we will actually have a second. It's, it's possible, certainly, and it's also the case that um, we are too polarized a country now uh, to function in any coherent way. Uh, the two sides, whatever they are, uh, just shout at each other, you know. And um, the... Uh, failure of the American dream has put the country into a kind of frenzy or hysteria. Uh, it can be a low-level hysteria or an obvious hysteria, but it's there. Um, we're already shooting each other up. You know, there's, if you define a massacre as four people killed or maimed, uh, yeah, four people killed or maimed, that's if you define a massacre in those terms, there's more than one a day occurring in the United States. I mean, we're already eating ourselves alive. Uh, and whether it will come to uh, open warfare in the streets, um, hard to say, but in terms of uh, decline, uh, it's going to happen with or without that. And just uh, another note, briefly, you wrote also an essay about it and Are We There Yet? The surveillance or Police state, would you call it a, a police state where it's kind of like Germany in the 1930s? You know, about 10 years ago, I had canceled my Facebook and I was not using any social media because of the all the NSA spying. And then later it comes out that even if you don't ha use social media, they still know all that stuff about you with the technology that they have. So I said, you know. I might as well start using it for for the good the the good that you can get out of it. So um, and besides, you know, we we're not gonna. I, I'm already in my mid thirties. You know, life's life's short, so I, I kind of don't care at, at this point. I'll, I'll, and so this is just kind of a. What can you tell us about this police state surveillance grid? It seems most Americans are oblivious to it. They say that I've got nothing to hide. I would disagree with that. Um, what are your thoughts there? Well, uh, I think you're right. Most Americans don't care uh, about it. Um, and um, I don't see any way of stopping it. Um, NSA, Mark Zuckerberg, whatever, uh, data will be collected. Um, and uh, the... Um, uh, I, I, I really don't know what to say about it. I, I think that, um, I mean, it's a sign of a country that's 
terribly, terribly afraid and thinks that the answer to its fear is more control when actually more control just brings more fear. And uh, we are not going to, I don't think we're going to reverse that trend unless it breaks down, like in Gary Steingart's novel, unless it really breaks down. Um, but Americans are oblivious to most things. Um, I mean, what's what's on the typical American mind is almost laughable. And uh, if you say you're being watched, they don't really care. I mean, they, they it's not like, I mean, you've got a few people at the American Civil Liberties Union jumping up and down, but they don't represent most of the United States. And most of the United States doesn't care about surveillance or even the fact that the Bill of Rights doesn't really exist anymore. They just don't care. Uh, and, and and now moving to, towards, I guess, a little bit more positive uh, note. Uh, in your essay, you briefly wrote about Russia. I was there last year. I'm living in the former Soviet Union. What's your take on Russia and Russian society these days? Um, because it seems that, you know, they had their collapse in the 90s and it was a really horrible. They tell, you know, millions of people died. It was worse than the Great Depression for the Russians in the 1990s. But since Putin came to power in 2000, uh, it seems that they have been rebuilding their society and that they have been developing common values and old traditions, things that you write about. And this all seems to be kind of positive. You know, or, or do you think they're going in the right direction, societies like Russia today? Well, you know, I've never been to Russia. Um, and I I can't say I'm an expert. I mean, it, it's, uh, I just don't have any expertise in that area. Um, there exists, uh, there's an issue of loss and gain in every major change. And um, communism, in my mind, was uh, one of the more depressing types of uh, political formations <laughs> in the history of the world. Um, but, uh, you know, it did provide education, uh, welfare, uh, food. Um, I mean, it was, it was, uh, it, it, it did, uh, cover basics as, uh, as best it could. And, um, uh, that, and also the, the idea of community in general existed under communism. But, um, then, as you said, once that broke down in 89, 90, uh, there was this free for all capitalist, um, uh, adoption of the capitalist model and millions were killed, hurt, whatever by it. Um, and now this whole business of returning to older traditions makes a lot of sense to me because what do you finally have to hang on to? Uh, I mean, it didn't work making a religion out of Lenin. It just didn't work. And the United uh, capitalism doesn't have any kind of spiritual or moral center. So that didn't work either. Um, I think uh, looking back on old traditions uh, makes a lot of sense. Uh, what that bodes for the future of Russia, I have no idea, but um, at least it's a value system. Uh, you know, I mean, the Pope some couple of years ago said we have to recapture the values of traditional cultures. Uh, they have, uh, uh, those native cultures have a lot to teach us. And it's it's a lesson that would be completely lost on an American audience, but uh, I think Russians might be able to appreciate uh, what he was talking about, as well as lots of other nations. And you know, finally, something you mentioned in your book uh, about dual process and what we mentioned about Russia. You know, a after this financial collapse and whatever comes. Uh, what do you see in the U U in the U.S.? You talk about this concomitant emergence of alternatives arising in America. Uh, I mean, wh what tradition or, or, or value do you see now? Maybe it, roots that are developing. Uh, well, it's a complex thing. By dual process, I meant that as capitalism disintegrates, uh, there were people who were trying alternative experiments with energy, currency, ways of living, and so on to create the structures that would replace the structures that are breaking down. Um, this, uh, there's a lot more incentive for that 
in countries that have gone through austerity, Greece, Portugal, uh, Spain, um, there's just, uh, in those countries, there's a lot more experiments along those lines, uh, all with alternate currency and alternate energy and different ways of living. Um, but the real problem for the United States is that after 400 years of hustling and a competitive mentality, uh, it's, it's very overwhelming, those 400 years. Hustling remains dominant. We're not Japan. We aren't Japan. We aren't countries that have a cooperative tradition. And my guess is that, I mean, um, you know, Joel Magnuson wrote a book years ago called uh, The Approaching Great Transformation. And he was trying to make a case of the fact that these alternative experiments were going on across the United States. And he traveled. He went from one community to another. And what he discovered in a number of cases, if not the majority, was that it was still operating. These experiments were still operating within the framework of hustling and economic expansion. Um, they had just adopted the right kind of green vocabulary uh, to mask it. But push comes to shove, uh, they were like Starbucks or Ben and Jerry's. I mean, they weren't really alternatives at all. And um, the phrase that arose, I don't know if Joel coined it, but it's a well-known phrase now, greenwashing. Uh, in the case of greenwashing, uh, it's just green capitalism. It's Thomas Friedman and Al Gore who make millions off of green capitalism, but it's still capitalism. And so I think that the possibilities for the positive side of dual process are going to happen elsewhere. Uh, as I said, places like Spain and Portugal and Greece and uh, Japan and other places, I think that it's going to arise elsewhere. And I think these are going to provide an alternative model uh, for how a country or a, a socioeconomic system uh, can live. Uh, I, you know, I'd like to say that uh, the United States was exploring those alternatives, but many years ago, William Ophels, who has written about um, energy and sustainability and so on, he was the assistant to several American ambassadors to Japan. So he lived there for many years. And in 1975, he wrote and he said that it's very, very unlikely that America in the crunch could be able to follow the Japanese model because they have a history of community working together in group consciousness. And we have a history of competing and bettering, you know, being better than your neighbor and uh, getting ahead and hustling. And you can't uh, create these cooperative structures with the wrong mentality, and we have the wrong mentality. I think that's right. And so here we're sitting on the outskirts of empire. You're down uh, on the southern border in Mexico. I've decided to remove myself even further out here in, in Kazakhstan. And any, any, final, any other thoughts? What what else can we say uh, about all of this? Anything you'd like to mention more? Well, I mean, I, I would say that uh, leaving the country is a sign of great intelligence. <laughs> <laughs> so you and I are among the bright ones, I guess. Uh, well, that's a bit immodest. But I, I mean it. What I said to the younger generation is exactly that. This is not the place to be. This is simply not the place to be. Um, and if, uh, I mean, there are those left-wing writers who espouse revolution. I think that's a bad joke. Um, there are well-meaning progressives that say, well, we've got to elect Bernie Sanders or, uh, you know, we have to oppose Kavanaugh uh, for the Supreme Court. And so you can knock yourself out doing that. But at the end of the day, it's still the United States, and that's the problem. It has always stood for one thing, and that's money. And finally, you can't, just can't have a viable, decent civilization based on the notion of accumulation and nothing else. 
And so if you think you can turn around 400 years, I mean, quite frankly, Jimmy Carter tried to do that. He actually tried to do that. That famous spiritual malaise speech that he gave in Annapolis in July of 1979 was, you know, we have to turn inward. We have to forget about all this consumerism and so on. Do you know that the next day several congressmen took the floor and suggested that he had gone insane? In other words, any deviation from the American dream, ipso facto, by definition, means that you're insane. You know, I mean, what he was trying to do was wake a country up, but uh, he was not able to turn around 400 years of history. And the subsequent reaction to that, which was the election of Ronald Reagan by the greatest landslide in terms excuse me, in terms of electoral votes, by the greatest landslide of any presidential election in all of American history was the American people saying, we're not interested in sustainability and community or any of those sorts of values. We want to make money, and Ronnie says we can and we should, and he's our man. Well, we're living with the results of that now, but it didn't start merely with Ronnie. You know, I mean, the founding fathers all died very wealthy. And when Jefferson said uh, pursuit of happiness, he meant pursuit of property. Everybody knew that. That was 18th century code words for get yours, you know. Well, we've been doing that for a very long time. It's not going to change. And uh, it has very real social and psychological consequences. And if you stay in the United States, you will suffer those consequences. You know, I, I will still say I'm a proud U.S. citizen, but also about three months ago, I became a proud Mexican citizen. Um, oh, congratulations. Thanks. <laughs> uh, so when are you going to become a Mexican citi citizen? <laughs> I, I actually love Mexico. I really love it. And uh, as I said, I have no friends in the United States. I have close friends here. It's a way of life that's gracious. Um, it's, I, I just love the country and I'm so excited that, uh, AMLO, Lopez Obrador, uh, was elected, you know, um, I think, uh, Mexico, uh, has, has some possibilities left in it, but I have never bothered about actual citizenship, uh, because all that matters to me is being able to cross a border. In other words, what is my passport for? It's not identification. I mean, I, I'm much more. Uh, you know, teary-eyed, romantic, or whatever about Mexico than I am about the United States, that's for sure. But um, at the same time, uh, a passport is just a passport. I don't care what color it is, and I don't care where it comes from. As far as I'm concerned, it can come from the Ivory Coast, as long as I can go to Italy for holiday or something like this, or visit friends in the United States or whatever. That's all that that's all that really matters to me. So, getting Mexican citizenship to me. Um, it would be okay, but um, I, I don't feel I need it, let me say that, any more than I need Bulgarian citizenship. So uh, uh, I have the equivalent of a green card down here, and uh, that works. And, and final thoughts, since you mentioned uh, AMLO, uh, and what are your thoughts on Mexico going forward? You've got people saying it's going to become Venezuela. You've got others saying that he's going to fix everything and others that just say the status quo will sort of continue. I think says, unfortunately, I think the status quo will continue. Amlo is a Franklin Roosevelt figure and he will instigate, and has already laid out some of his plans in this regard. He will instigate programs, uh, you know, like the NRA and WPA and so on, <coughs> excuse me, to get the country going economically, but also, uh, to uh, re provide relief uh, for uh, you know people that are starving or on the edge of it uh, or having a rough time, I think he will do Roosevelt type things. But in the end, in the end, anybody who's going to be uh, the president of Mexico has to deal with one enormous fact, and that's the northern neighbor and its capitalist pressure. After all, 80% of the goods produced in Mexico, manufactured in Mexico, are sold on the American market. I'm not talking about drugs. I'm talking about, you know, refrigerators. Um, and when you have that much of an overlap and a tie-in, 
you can't get free of the giant. The giant is there. The giant is the reality. Uh, the second thing I would say about AMLO is that famous graffito of, 19, of the 1960s, although supposedly Mark Twain and uh, Emma Goldman said something uh, similar, uh, and that was um, if elections could change anything, they would be declared illegal. And I think there's a lot of truth in that. Uh, you can only expect so much to happen as a result of the ballot box. And what's going to have to happen if there are going to be changes in Mexico is that the youth are going to have to realize that the American dream sucks. Right now, they don't realize it. Most of the youth are pursuing it in one form or another. But I've talked to this before, about this before to Mexican audiences. And I said, you know, I remember years ago, I was traveling through Chiapas, a very poor state, and I remember seeing a graffito on the wall that said, Nuestros sueños no caben en sus, uh, en, uh, en sus urnas. Yeah. No caben en sus urnas. Uh, your, uh, our dreams don't fit into your ballot boxes. And it's true. I mean, the the youth in Mexico has to decide to go in a different direction, as some of the youth in Japan has done. In fact, they call them the Satori generation, the ones that turn their back on Mitsubishi and Toyota and, you know, having eating in fancy restaurants and all that and basically want to cultivate a different way of life. The real historical changes are organic. They occur from the bottom up and slowly, slowly, uh, things start to happen. I hope that happens for Mexico. And I think uh, AMLO is a wonderful change from the two clowns that preceded him. But there's only so much he can do given the uh, geopolitical circumstances. All right. We'll end it there. You have, um, just reminding listeners, the, your first trilogy on human consciousness. People can go check that out. And then you have the trilogy on the American Empire. Uh, and you have numerous, just tell us a little bit about your, your latest works and where people can find you. I think the only place online is your, your, blo uh, your blog. Uh, your latest works include um, On Japan, Your Neurotic Beauty, your latest collection of essays, Are We There Yet? I think The Man Without Qualities is, is a novel you recently wrote. It's a novel. It's a, it's a satire in American politics. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those are the most most uh, recent works, and I'm currently working on a book on Italy. So, um, you know, I say to all our listeners, happy reading. <laughs> I think you have a lot of material uh, uh, writing about Italy. So. Yeah, no doubt about it, right? All right, well, thank you, Dr. Berman, for your time. Thanks for the interview. I appreciate it.